Good morning, church. Uh, my name is Justin, our student pastor here at the Poto campus. I'm going to be reading out of Acts chapter 12, starting in verse 1, will be our scripture this morning. Starting in verse 1, it says, About that time, King Herod Agrippa became, began to persecute some believers in the church. He had the apostle James, John's brother, killed with a sword. When Herod saw how much this pleased the Jewish people, he also arrested Peter. This took place during the Passover celebration. Then he imprisoned him, placing him under the guard of four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring Peter out for public trial after the Passover. But while Peter was in prison, the church prayed very earnestly for him. And this is the word of the Lord. Well, today we are jumping back into our Acts series. Uh, if you're a guest or uh, haven't been coming here long, we want to say welcome. We are actually jumping back into a series that we started sometime last year, and we took a, a break from for a couple of months, and now we find ourselves back in Acts chapter 12. So what I want to do as we begin today, before just jumping off in the middle of a book, is I would like to uh, do my best to catch you up on uh, where we've been in Acts. And so what we've said from the very beginning is Acts of the, is the story of how God built his church through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, God is going to continue to build his church, but he's also, uh, from about the midpoint of Acts on, going to be maintaining and strengthening his church through the power of the Holy Spirit. So here's how this began. If you don't know the story of the gospel, here it is in just a few short words. Uh, Jesus Christ uh, was reigning and ruling in heaven with God. God looks down at a world that is broken and marred by sin. You've experienced this. You know the brokenness and the pain and the hurt of this world. God looks down on the brokenness, the pain, the sin of this world, and he chooses to send his son, Jesus. So Jesus Christ came to earth. He was born of a virgin named Mary. He took on flesh. He lived uh, this life, and he did so perfectly. He lived a perfect, sinless life here. And the reason he did that, he was, he was going to offer himself as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the world. Where sin had separated us from God, Jesus Christ came to offer himself as a, a, a sacrifice for our sins um, that we might be reunited with God. And so that's what happened at the end of every gospel. You see that Jesus is crucified on a cross for the sins of the world as he, as he hangs there on the cross. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. This is God's heart toward the world. And Jesus, he went to the grave for three days, and after three days, he rose from the dead. He comes and he appears to 500 people in one, one uh, setting, and then he would appear to his disciples. And what he said to him is, he said, hey, hey, guys, I want you to wait for me in Jerusalem. Don't go take off and try to do ministry of your own power or your own strength. Don't try to be the, the church on your own, uh, but I want you to wait in Jerusalem. And you're going to receive the Holy Spirit. And when you receive the Spirit, you are going to receive power. And you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria, even to the ends of the earth. And when the Holy Spirit came, they did indeed receive power. The man Peter, who had previously denied even knowing who Jesus was, he boldly proclaimed the gospel on the day of Pentecost. When the Holy Spirit fell on those people, uh, the disciples of Jesus Christ, they were declaring the mighty works of God. And people from every tribe and tongue under heaven were there. And they heard the mighty deeds of God, the gospel, in their own tongue. And so a few thousand people came to faith in Jesus Christ on the day of Pentecost. And the church is off and running. And God continued to, to grow and to shape and mold the church. They were being built up. They they were gathering in Solomon's colonnade to listen to the apostles preach. They were going house to house, praying together, strengthening one another in fellowship. And then a persecution broke out in Jerusalem. Uh, the man Stephen was martyred for his faith. And the churches scattered across the known world. The gospel left Jerusalem. And it began to infiltrate Judea and Samaria. And even further beyond that, as the church in Jerusalem was scattered by this persecution. Now, uh, the apostle Paul, who we know as Paul, formerly known as Saul, was one of the chief persecutors of the church. As a matter of fact, he asked for letters from the synagogue officials to go to other places outside of, of Jerusalem to find these scattered believers that he might put them in prison. Somewhere along the way, he meets Jesus Christ. His life has changed. He becomes 
becomes the chief evangelist and missionary of the church, and God continued to build his church in power. We see the Holy Spirit come not just to the Jews on the day of Pentecost, but we see it among the Samaritans, who the, the Jews would have regarded as half-blood Jews. They, were kinda, they weren't um, real Jews. They didn't count. They didn't think they should probably even receive the Holy Spirit, but God saved them anyway. And it went from, um, from the Jews to the Samaritans and even to the Gentiles, the Greeks who knew nothing of the law or the Old Testament. They too received the Holy Spirit. They began living lives that have been transformed by the power of the gospel as followers of Jesus and miraculous things are happening. It was beautiful. It's amazing what God has done to build his church. Here we are as legacy members of the original church in Jerusalem, right? So God has done a great work. Today, as we enter back into the story of how God is building his church through his power of the Holy Spirit in Acts, um, man, you know, God sometimes just like arranges circumstances in such a way that um, certain passages just really point toward um, some things that are happening in our day. And so we left this a few months ago and plan to come back to it here very soon. But uh, if you don't know what's going on in our world today, um, Vladimir Putin, Russia, uh, they've invaded Ukraine. Um, man, there's casualties. There's loss of life, brutal war going on. I don't know how closely you have, have followed it, but the people of Ukraine, uh, they have done their best to resist the attacks, but uh, the Russian army is vast um, in both capability and the number of soldiers. They're a, a nuclear power, and you have little bitty Ukraine that doesn't have a lot of people and certainly doesn't have the military might. And so uh, in the midst of our world, right, you have like a David and Goliath situation. And um, I guess the question I would ask is, how should the church respond we're the church of Jesus Christ. How do we respond in such circumstances where we see the tragic and devastating results of war? Um, people are fleeing in droves. If you know Rhonda Baxter, she is one of our missionaries that we, we support, and some of the people that she works with happen to be in the European theater. And so she has friends from uh, R Romania and Moldova who are emailing her because she's kind of their support person, you know. And uh, they're, they're saying, you know, man, we have refugees, and they're talking about the fears of the war basically being at their doorstep right there in the neighboring countries. And uh, things are extraordinarily difficult uh, this week, I was reading um, uh, one of the, uh, it's not a blog, it's a website that I follow, Gospel Coalition, and they told the story of a, a pastor in Kiev, where it's kind of the, the center of the, the fighting, where the Russian forces are uh, fighting very hard to get there and to take the capital city. Um, his, his church is just outside of a village that got attacked, actually today, um, Erpen. I don't know if y'all saw that in the news, but the uh, Russian forces have been there. And he's the pastor of Urban Bible Church there, or Urban Bible Church. And they had been praying and fasting for about a week, knowing that something was happening. Like, what's our response going to be? And so as they prayed and fasted, they felt like God was calling them to stay because they're the church of Jesus Christ. And we offer ourselves in service to people, right? And so um, they've begun doing training, and so they're training their people on how to use a tourniquet and bandage wounds and uh, clear an airway for people who are injured. And they're, you know, they've been stockpiling food and things that they could be the church of Jesus Christ in the midst of a, a war zone. Um, heard from one of my professors this week, uh, one of his Ph.D. students is uh, one of the heads of the seminary, the Baptist seminary there in Kiev in Ukraine, and they've shut down their classes, and they're going to serve people, and they're leaving themselves in harm's way to care for those who are in need. I want you to hear uh, the words from the pastor of Urban Bible Church. He says, when this is over, the citizens of Kiev will remember how Christians have responded in their time of need. Um, if the church is not relevant in times of crisis, then it's not relevant in a time of peace. Um, today, we, we would ask ourselves, what's our role and here we are, uh, thousands of miles removed from what is an awful situation. But those are our brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, there are people on both sides that are uh, enduring hardship and suffering that we have not yet known. And so the question I want to ask and hopefully answer for you today is what is our role as a church um, in the midst of this sort of crisis? 
Now, again, I told you that God kind of, in his wisdom, led us to this text. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 12. This is actually kind of the last picture that we get in Acts of the uh, intimate portrait of the church in Jerusalem and how they function. Uh, pretty much from this point out, we're going to see the Apostle Paul and him you know, going to these unreached areas and preaching the gospel and founding churches. Uh, but this is the last little portrait we get of the church in Jerusalem, and it's a grim one. Uh, a famine had broken out in the land, and so they're enduring that. Uh, but much more significantly, the church in Jerusalem is suffering a pretty heavy persecution at the hands of Agrippa. So read with me here in verse 1. It says, About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. Now, you may have read about Herod in the Bible or heard his name and thought, man, that guy must have lived for a really long time, reigned for a long time. You might have heard about him in, in history. Um, Herod was basically a, a, the king who was put in place by Rome to rule the people. And so Rome is the ruler of everything at this point, right? They're the, they're the big dog. However, uh, in order to control the, the people in the various places, they would appoint a, a Herod, basically kind of a pontiff, to um, keep the peace in these places. And so this Herod is one of many. There's Herod the Great, uh, Agrippa, Herod Philip. Uh, we're looking at Herod Agrippa. And if you don't know much about Herod Agrippa, you might remember the story uh, with the birth of Jesus. When Jesus was born, and there's this buzz in all of Jerusalem, uh, they've heard that the king of the Jews has been born in, in Bethlehem of Judea. And the wise men, they come to, to Herod, and they're like, hey, we've come to see the king of the Jews. And Herod's like, yeah, I don't know exactly where he is, but when you find him, would you let me know? Because I want to see him too. Um, and the, the wise men, they didn't go back and report to Herod, uh, which was a good thing, right? Uh, and so Herod, in retaliation, because he feared one being born king of the Jews, he went in the whole region of Bethlehem and he slaughtered every male that was two years old and younger. This is the same Herod who was so pleased with a young lady dancing for him that he offered to grant her any of her requests, up to half of his kingdom. And when she requested the head of John the Baptist on a platter, he served it up to her. This is a violent and brutal and powerful king. You see, he'd actually gotten his role because he was friends with a couple of different Caesars, the, the emperors of Rome. He was friends with them, and that's how he'd gotten this appointment. Um, as a matter of fact, that's why he got to be called a king. Uh, it was okay for him because he was friends with Caesar to regard himself in this way. And so here we find this brutal, violent ruler Herod in Jerusalem, and he has laid hands, violent hands, on some who belong to the church. Now, the church had been born, and then the church had been scattered across the known world. Some of them had gathered back to Jerusalem. The church had continued to expand, and now they find themselves, they've already seen Stephen martyred within the city of Jerusalem, stoned to death uh, for his faith. And now Herod is laying hands on some of the people in the church and especially upon James. Now, when it says violent hands here, uh, we're not told exactly, you know, what he did, what violence he did to all the people. It basically means to abuse or to mistreat or in some way harm. And so, uh, again, we're not told the story of what he did to all of the people in the church that he laid hands on, uh, but this was not a nice treatment. I want you to imagine, if you will, people in this church being arrested and abused and beaten, that very publicly people were being executed. That's what happened to James. Now, this is James, not the brother of Jesus. This is James, the brother of John, the sons of Zebedee. You might uh, know them as the, the Boanerges, the sons of thunder. These were uh, fiery, bold, charismatic men. They would have been leaders in the church at Jerusalem. Uh, the apostles uh, were the guys that kind of everyone looked to. These men were certainly apostles, and they were their leaders. They were the ones that everyone looked to, uh, to, you know, how are we supposed to live? What does it look like to follow Jesus? And now James has been put to death by the sword. There's a famine in the land. There's a brutal ruler who's persecuting the church. He killed James with a sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, this just adds a little more color to the story. 
Imagine living in a city where if people would arrest members of your church and abuse them or even kill them, it would please the general populace. They would applaud the ruler that did it. Herod was likely doing this just to curry favor with the Jews that he might more easily control them. It's not a good time to be a member of the church in Jerusalem. It says, when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also, the guy that preached on Pentecost, one of the leaders of the church. He's been arrested also. And when, they, when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So this happens to be um, during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Um, this goes way back to uh, God delivering his people out of Egypt. They were enslaved and oppressed in Egypt, and so God leads his people out. And the Feast of Unleavened Bread was observed every year, began with the Passover, and then they would observe this seven days of feasting, unleavened bread, to remember how God had led them out of slavery and out of oppression. So this is taking place in Jerusalem, and every male you know, man uh, was required to be in Jerusalem for this feast, every Jewish male. So there are thousands of Jews in the city, and Herod sees this as his opportunity. Uh, you want to see me persecute Christians? And you want to know that I'm on your side, Jesus? I'm going to bring Peter out, and I'm going to put him to death as well. But he couldn't do it during the feast because that was seen as distasteful. So he's holding Peter in prison, awaiting the day that he can bring him out and kill him just as he had James. Now, he put him in prison. It's likely that he was put into a fortress that overlooked the temple, a very secure place. It tells us that he was uh, held with four squads of soldiers. This was unusual. Uh, but Peter had escaped prison once before, and Herod was going to make sure it didn't happen again. Uh, it goes on, it says, um, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Um, the circumstances are really, really dire. Uh, again, we talk about a David and Goliath situation. This is one of them. You have the church, which has no political power. They don't have representatives in Congress. They don't have people on their side. They don't get to vote for their politicians. They are not people of standing. They actually are, are living out a, a religion of faith following Jesus. It was not a religio lesita. It was not a legal religion in their day, which is why Herod can put followers of the way to death. They're this marginal little population inside of a city, and you have this powerful king who has even more powerful friends who's already already put two-year-old boys to death. He's already put John the Baptist to death. He's put James to death, and now he's laying hands on Christians in the city. This is not a good situation for the people. And then he takes Peter, and he puts him in this fortress, and he has him guarded with four sets of soldiers to make sure he doesn't escape. You're going to see in a minute that he's bound with two chains, and he's chained to two different soldiers. Um, there's a really, really bad situation here. But you know what the church did? They didn't have the power to do anything. They couldn't go fight the Roman sentries guarding Peter. They couldn't overtake the fortress. They couldn't do a lot of things. Uh, but they did the one thing that mattered. This is verse 5. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. One little sentence. They just prayed. There was nothing else that they could do. They pray. And I want you to see how God worked in their midst, in the midst of a situation that would have been hopeless. I mean, I couldn't escape chains. I'm not an escape artist, but I certainly couldn't do it while chained to a couple of soldiers inside of a fortress which is guarded by three other sets of soldiers. It's not happening. Hopeless situation. Look in verse 6. Now, when Herod was about to bring him out, Herod's moment where all the Jews have been gathered and their feast is over and he gets to put on display this act that's going to please all the Jews by putting Peter to death. When Herod was about to bring him out on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers. He was bound with two chains and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him, woke him, saying, Get up quickly. Now, isn't this interesting? Um, Peter, on the night, he's going to be brought out. He's going to be put to death. Likely, it's possible they would have put him on trial, but there's no indication that that was true. Here he is. He's sleeping. He's chained to two soldiers, and he feels something nudging him. Peter, get up. 
Put on your clothes. Put your sandals on. We're going somewhere. Now, if this sounds a little bit out there to you, it's because it should. All right, this is not normal stuff. This is absolutely supernatural in, na- in nature. As a matter of fact, Peter didn't even think this was real. All right? Peter thought he must be dreaming. So uh, read with me. The angel said to him, dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, wrap your cloak. Like, put on some clothes, Peter. We're going out in public, right? Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and he followed him. He did not know that what was being done by the angel was real. He thought he was seeing a vision. He's like... The chains fell off my hands here. Somehow the guards didn't notice that I got up, got dressed, fixed my hair, put the cloak on, got the sandals on my feet. I've just walked out of this prison. The guards didn't even, oh, I've seen a vision before. That's what's happening. I'm I'm seeing a vision because chains don't fall off, y'all. Not two chains and not when you're chained as soldiers, right? You don't just walk out of a fortress when the powerful king wants to keep you captive. It doesn't happen. He did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. And when they had passed the first and then the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city, and it opened for them. It's a dream. It's a vision. I mean, the gate just opened. That doesn't happen, right? It opened for them of its own accord, and they went out, they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel left him. And this is the moment of realization for Peter. I don't know if he pinched himself. I don't know what happened here. But somehow he comes to his senses that this was not a dream. But this was the mighty hand of God at work for him. Verse 11, when Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. And Herod was going to kill me. And the people, the Jewish people, they were expecting him to do so. They were going to applaud him all along the way. But look what the hand of God has done. And there was no chance that the church could make a run against the fortress. There was no chance that Peter could escape. But y'all, when God is in the equation, um, everything changes, right? If God is for us, who or what could ever stand against us? Look here in verse 12. It's funny because you see the human response of people here. Verse 12, when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose name was Mark. So John Mark's mother, uh, I guess Mary, had a house somewhere nearby. Peter goes there, and there were many people gathered together and were praying. And when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. And recognizing Peter's voice, in her joy, she didn't open the gate. Uh, but instead, she ran in and reported that people were standing at the gate. And they said to her, this is the response that you and I would have, right? If someone told us something like this happened in our church, we would say, um, you're out of your mind. She kept insisting that it was so. But they kept saying, well, it's an angel. There's no way that this could ever happen. We understand the equation here. God uh, you know, would have to do the miraculous in order for this to happen. So you must have seen an angel. It must be a vision. You must be crazy. And yet um, they weren't indeed. They said to her, you're out of your mind. She kept insisting it was so. So they kept saying it's an angel. But Peter continued knocking. He's like, hey, guys, um, while y'all are having your discussion, I'm still out here on the street. You know, like someone going to open the gate? Motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of prison. He said, tell these things to James and to the brothers. And then he departed and he went to another place. Now, when the day came, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. Okay. Two chains, two soldiers, four sets of guards. He was in a fortress. How did he get out of here? No little discussion about what had happened. Um, they didn't find him, and he examined the sentries. And, I'm sorry, after Herod searched for him, he didn't find him. He examined the sentries, and they ordered that they should be put to death. He went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent time there. Herod doesn't know what happened. He knows that Peter somehow escaped his grasp, so he's got issues to deal with down in Caesarea. Now, it, the story continues here, and I think it's all related. You might have a chapter division, but this is all together. It says, Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. You know that uh, there was a famine in the land. 
Um, the people of Tyre and Sidon, they had to depend upon Herod for food. And for some reason, they had offended Herod. It, was, it wasn't going well in their relationship. And so they came to him with one accord. They, they've got to get in right relationship. They're going to keep eating. So they come to him with one accord, having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, and they asked for peace because their country depended on the king's country for food. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes and took his seat upon the throne and delivered an oration to them. Now, this is one of those things. Herod is kind of drunk with his power here. He thinks he's something, y'all. I mean, he's King Herod. He can order you to be executed. I mean, he can do whatever he wants. He's got food. He can withhold it or he can give it. And so he's essentially saying, come and kiss the ring, y'all. You need to bow down in my presence. Um, Josephus is a Jewish historian. He actually described this day and this event. And he said that and Herod actually put on a robe that was made of silver, such that when he would, would, would stand up in the sun, it would reflect, and they thought that he looked like a god due to the reflection of the silver. Now, this is an unbeliever, not a, a biblical source, but he just sheds a little more color on what happened on this day. And so the people who need Herod to give them food, who need to be in his good graces, in verse 22, after he gives this oration, this speech, says the people were shouting, the voice of a God and not a man. This is what they said about the Caesars, right? Uh, I'm a God. I'm not a man, right? And so here he finds himself along in good company with his friends. People are calling him a God, and he's eating it up because he's pretty powerful. And when he, when he walks, uh, people pay attention. When he speaks, people listen. He's drunk with his own power. The people were shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. And immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory. He was eaten by worms and breathed his last. But the word of God increased and multiplied. What is the church to do when we encounter times of persecution? When we feel like, when we look at, you know, we kind of survey the battlefield, if you will. When you look at Russia and you look at Ukraine and you think, man, there's just no way. You got, I mean, Russia, nuclear power. Putin's a crazy man, right? He's kind of drunk on his own power. He doesn't care about people. He's committed crimes before this little bitty country. What's going to happen? You know what the church does? We pray. Uh, because here's two things I want you to know about God. Number one, God is sovereign over everything in every place at every time. God is more powerful than any, than any army, than any ruler, than any other thing. And here's the good news. God is also good. He is working on behalf of his people. He's accomplishing his work. The cross would tell us that God loved every single person in that city. God loved every soldier. God loved Herod. God loved the church. He loved the people enough to send his son to die for them. And he wasn't going to let Herod stand in the way of what he wanted to accomplish. Now, there's something we need to know about this story. It's important to point out. When we think about persecution and we think about difficulty, we read stories of God's miraculous deliverance. You need to know that there's another person in the story that didn't get delivered. That James died by the sword. And other people in the church were mistreated and abused. Our God absolutely can deliver. There is hope in any and every situation because our God is sovereign. However, sometimes God allows the suffering to last. He allows people to be abused. He allowed James to be killed. Now, James wasn't mad about this, by the way. Um, when he uh, breathed his last breath here on this earth, he opened his eyes in the presence of God. He was, he was glad to be there, right? He's like, I'm with Jesus again. I'm in heaven. There's no more suffering and no more pain. James was fine with it. And yet, if you're a part of the church, you're probably not fine with it. If you were John, the brother of James, you weren't fine with it. This was difficult. Yet the church continued believing in the power of God. They trusted in God's goodness, in his sovereign plan. And the church was earnestly praying for Peter, gathered together, asking God to do what they could never do. Um, in this hour, in this time in our world, um, I don't know what God's going to do. I don't know what God's going to do in Ukraine I don't know what God's going to do with all the refugees, the families who have been separated, the people who have lost loved ones. Uh, I don't know how much suffering the world's about to endure. Um, but I, what I want you to know is that God is in control and God is good. And what God would have his church do, those of us who get to go home and we're going to eat a, a big meal and sleep comfortably in our beds tonight, um, what we can do on behalf of the people is pray. 
And it'd be easy for us to get caught up in our life and we got work tomorrow and things going and forget that. So uh, today we're going to pray corporately as a body. I'm going to invite Gary Jordan, one of our elders up here, to lead us in this prayer. Uh, But I want to challenge you guys. Throughout this week, would you consider fasting if you need to fast to remind you to pray on behalf of people that you don't know and haven't met but Jesus Christ absolutely loves? Would you pray that the gospel goes forth, that these missionaries that Rhonda knows, and she can tell you all about them because she's got lots of stories uh, to, to how to pray for them better. Would you pray that God gives them favor and provision to do all that God wants to do, that his will would be done, and that the name of Jesus Christ would be lifted up over and against any ruler who would make a claim on this earth? Gary, would you come and lead us in our time of prayer? Thank you. If you'd bow with me. Father, it's a, it's a privilege to come before you amongst other brothers and sisters. Lord, and uh, I'm grateful for your sovereignty and that I know that you're in control. And Father, when things happen that don't make sense, I will trust and I'll rest in you. This morning, we pray for the people of Ukraine. Their country's been invaded. Their homes and businesses are being destroyed. There's families being separated and displaced. And there are those who have died. Lord, we pray for for strength and courage and perseverance for those. For those who are currently in harm's way, we pray for protection and a way out of it. Lord, we pray for those who will be forcibly displaced, that during this time that you'll find they'll find comfort in you, Father. Lord, I, um, I uplift the leaders, governmental, military, Father, that they would be given wisdom. Father, I pray that, that you would encourage them to put a pause on what's going on in this country, Father, that they would be stopped. Lord, I pray for, for those who are fighting that on both sides, that you would provide protection for them. Even in this country, Father, for those who've been called up or deployed into neighboring countries, I pray for their protection as well. Lord, I pray for the the local churches there, for the aid organizations, that they would be given access to help those who are in need. Father, that they would know how to care for those. Specifically, I pray for the the Baptist Theological Seminary there, Father, that they would know how to help their students and that they would take care of them. And for the Christians there, Father, that have a desire to be the light of this country, I pray that they would have the boldness and courage to do so. And ultimately, Father, for, for the unbelievers there, Father, who may have never heard, heard your word. And in these times, destruction, despair, Father, they're going to be looking for hope. And I pray that the gospel would be proclaimed boldly. And Father, that they would be able to see the hope in Jesus. Thank you for allowing us to come and and pray for this country and these people. And these things I pray. Amen. Sometimes we think about prayer and we think, is that all I can do? Um, What I hope you see from the story is that a group of people who had no power or otherwise to affect change, they prayed to the God who could. And God heard them, and he acted on their behalf, and he did the miraculous work. Um, That's what we're doing as we pray on behalf of both believers in Ukraine and in Russia, of soldiers on both sides of the battle. Uh, We pray for God to steer the heart of Putin and all the leaders here. Uh, We are going to battle on their behalf behalf. And so uh, I I mentioned the possibility of fasting this week. The reason I say fasting, um, when I don't eat, my body constantly reminds me of that. Um, I don't ever get distracted so much that I'm like, oh, I haven't eaten in two days. Like, it never happens to me. It's a really great way for us to be reminded to pray. And so this is a way that we can do battle on behalf of brothers and sisters around the world. And so I want to continue to call on you to pray. You've got the sheet there in your seat that you can spend time praying for that. I'm sure you're going to watch news. You're going to hear updates on more things to be prayed for. Uh, But today we want to be the church of Jesus Christ.
And that means that it's not always about us, but oftentimes it's about serving other people in this way. And so I just want to, again, call on you to pray. I'm going to um, close this out here with prayer. The band is going to come up. We're going to have a time of singing. I would just encourage you to worship the Lord who is good and who is all-powerful and all-sovereign over all things. Be reminded of God who's at work even when we can't see it. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I, I, I'm thankful for Gary, uh, for how he leads us as an elder, uh, for um, him as a man, uh, for the prayers that were offered up. Lord, we want to come to you on behalf of men and women that we don't know, that we haven't met, on behalf of the family of a Russian soldier who didn't want to go, on behalf of the person in Ukraine who's having to fight for their country. God, on behalf of the families and all the people involved, we want to come before our great God and ask you, God, to intervene on their behalf. We pray that you would put down unjust and evil rulers. We pray that you would prevent and protect uh, from attack. God, we pray for your deliverance, and we pray for peace in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, this is what we do. We come to the one who can. You are able. God, you are powerful, and you are sovereign. We lift these prayers up to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Would you stand with us and sing?